So coming up in part three, a brief history of psychology's practices towards indigenous people, which has been pretty terrible. And what is it doing now? Is it doing any better? <laughs> Why I'm negative about possible Back to the story, because I've got a story. So I've got some top tips on writing. I told you to think critically. It helps people like me stop doing stupid things. <laughs> so in parts one and two, we looked at the history of the Indigenising the Curriculum Project and the history of the colonisation of Indigenous people in Australia and why they're still treated as second-class citizens. Now we're going to turn our attention towards psychology. So, brief history of psychology's racist practices towards Indigenous Australians. Just to be clear, psychology is not alone in regard to having a horrid history in the way it has treated indigenous people and actually psychology did its worst in partnership with other professions particularly anthropology the study of cultures so psychology did its worst when it aligned itself with scientific racism in the early years of colonization and scientific racism largely sprung from social darwinism which basically stated that human development could be characterised as an evolution from the simple unevolved organism through to the complex evolved organism and map that idea onto contemporary human cultures, deeming indigenous culture as primitive and Anglo-European culture as advanced. In the swamps and plain and scrub of Arnhem Land, these primitive people live in an area stretching from Arnhem Bay on the Arafura Sea in the north. Today, in the 20th century, they are people who are still living in the ways of the Stone Age. It was used to justify the argument that indigenous culture should be left to die. That's where you get the genocide springing from, you know? Now, the supposed more charitable view was that indigenous people should be helped to become more Anglo-European or should be protected. Indigenous people were mostly treated like children, so immature, undeveloped, and in need of guidance. And you can see the first signs of this in the late 1800s in Australia with the setting up of the Indigenous Protection Boards. They were set up to look after the welfare of, ind of Indigenous people, and they referred to their role as acting in loco parentis, which is an English common law term referring to the responsibilities of a parent. To maintain that fiction that Indigenous people were unevolved, psychologists came in with their newly developed psychometric tools, such as intelligence testing, and they mostly studied Indigenous people at the missions run by the church and reserves run by the government, where many had fled to after being displaced from their homes. So early work produced ambiguous results. It couldn't be conclusively shown that indigenous people were, for example, less intelligent than white people. But some findings did show this, largely because the intelligence tests were culturally biased against non-Europeans, but also because the poor performance of indigenous people on these tests was because of the impoverished conditions in which they were living. Many were in a state of trauma caused by their displacement, and the violence of the early years of colonisation. But none of that was factored in. Instead, those findings were pushed to the public and fed the appetite for a political narrative to explain why Indigenous people were so disadvantaged. So psychology delivered research findings to politicians that were sanitised against any description or discussion of the social, political and historical context of the Indigenous people they were testing. Psychology didn't need to change its ways in that regard, it fitted perfectly with how psychology was aiming to establish itself as a positive science, a science that claimed to make objective observations about human behaviour and to strip away any concern for the politics of what it was doing. That psychological work had a receptive audience among politicians who needed to find a model justification for stealing indigenous land and for the violence they'd inflicted on the indigenous population, but it also had a receptive audience among white Australian culture who were, which was either keen to forget about the violence or had already forgotten about the violence. Stanner, in 1968, coined the phrase to describe this as the Great Australian Silence, summing up how by the mid 20th century, white Australians had effectively erased the, their memory of the violence of colonisation against indigenous people. 
This brutal history has never been taught in Australian schools, and many schoolchildren grow up oblivious to the knowledge of the apartheid that their country was founded on. Australian psychology practised its own great silence on the violence of colonisation, and it didn't break that silence until 2016, when the Australian Psychological Society, the APS, the main professional body representing psychologists in Australia, made a formal apology to Australian Indigenous people and the part it had played in their suffering. Now, let's talk about that apology and other things Australian psychology has been up to recently. Let's bring things up to date. So the APS apology, you can find it on their website and I'll put a link up in the description box below. The apology acknowledged the impoverished social conditions Indigenous people were living in and it listed some of the ways psychology had been complicit in the marginalisation of Indigenous people and then it listed the APA's new commitments to Indigenous Australians. That sounds like a good thing, but it wasn't really a good thing at all. The commitments the APS made in that apology were nothing more than the minimal standards for professional conduct specified in the APS Code of Ethics. So it committed to do stuff it was already committed to doing for everyone else. If anything, they just committed to not treat Indigenous people worse than they treated anyone else, which isn't doing much, is it? It's not much of a commitment. It's not much progress. Should have been doing that all along. Now, I'll put a link to the document, the APS ethics document, in the description box, so you can go and compare the APS apology with the APS commitments under the APS ethics code. So, really, it wasn't much of a commitment, but there's more that is troubling. But before I get onto that, let's look at how that apology came about. Really, the need for the apology became apparent way back in 1988 when things went spectacularly wrong with Australian psychology. It was the year Australia first hosted the International Congress of Psychology. This is a big thing because it was the point at which psychology in Australia gained full international recognition. Up until then, it had really struggled to gain international recognition, largely because until 1965, Australian psychology was just a branch of the British Psychological Society. Kind of like a franchise, like a McDonald's franchise, <laughs> if you like. You're a Ronald McDonald paint job! Hey! So that International Congress was a big thing, but it so happened that 1988 was important for another reason. In 1988 marked the 200th anniversary of the British colonisation of Australia. That was a year where there was a lot of political tension between those who wanted to celebrate this bicentennial event, mostly white Australians, and others who wanted to grieve over it, mostly Indigenous Australians. Over two and a half million people lined Sydney Harbour to be part of the celebrations commemorating the arrival of the first fleet in New South Wales and the beginning of European settlement in Australia. As the first fleet reenactment sailed through the heads, Thousands of Aboriginal people from all over the country made their presence known with the March for Freedom, Justice and Hope. The march was a statement of survival and at the exclusion of an Aboriginal voice in Australian history. 1988 was dubbed the Year of Mourning and the march was aimed at drawing national and international attention to Australia's appalling human rights record. The Bicentennial was a watershed moment in Australian history, marking the largest gathering of Indigenous people this country has ever seen, and it signified a shift in the dialogue between white and black Australia. 88. What does Australian psychology do in response to that, that was happening in 1988, when it was hosting the Congress? Well, it kind of ignored it. So at the International Congress, there was little mention of the issues facing Indigenous people in Australia or mention of the political debates happening at that time in Australia. But worse, the one representation of Indigenous people at the Congress was an unapologetic section of a photographic exhibition called Indigenous Aspects of Australian Culture, which consisted of a series of photographs 
of indigenous skulls that were collected for scientific measurement. Now, some of the international delegates at the Congress and some of the Australian psychologists were really quite shocked at this. And slowly, and I mean slowly, things started to change in Australian psychology. So at the 1991 annual Australian Psychological Society conference, I warned you, it was slow progress. It, it took, you know, three years. There was an interest group that was formed to address Indigenous issues. Two years later, the APS established a working party who took on the task of developing guidelines for psychologists working with Indigenous people. And in 2008, the APS formally recognised the Association for Indigenous Psychologists in the Australian Indigenous Psychologists Association, the AIPA. Now, we had to wait even longer for a plan of action to come from the APS to address the negative way psychology had been treating Indigenous people. That came in the form of a reconciliation plan, RAP, which the APS published in 2012. And then in 2016, a curriculum framework document was developed by the Australian Indigenous Psychology Education Project, AIPEP. And to bring us most up to date, for this video, which I'm recording in May 2020, the Australian Psychology Accreditation Council, APAC, this is the body that oversees the National Accreditation of Psychology Professional Training Programs, um, it became a co-signatory to a statement of commitment in relation to advancing the AIPEP curriculum framework. It was really only at that point, which was just last year, that we had a formalised and nationwide attempt taken by psychology in Australia to indigenise the curriculum. Okay, that was a lot to take in, but it's important detail, as it is within the APS apology, the APS reconciliation... Rick the APS Reconciliation Action Plan and the AIPEP Curriculum Framework document that we get a sense of what might be right and what might be wrong with psychology's attempts to indigenize its curriculum. Just to foreshadow that, the Curriculum Framework document is, I think, the most interesting document. There are many problems with it. The big problem is the lack of historical and political analysis that sits behind it. You know, it takes a Pollyanna-ish spin same can be said of the APS apology and the reconciliation plan. Pollyanna-ish just means everything looks rosy, everything looks wonderful. Um, you know, you could, you could never tell that blood had been spilt in the past and that we might not be able to just forgive and forget, or as Australians like to practice it, forget and forget. You get no sense of the pain that sits behind Indigenous people's concerns. But there's a small sign of hope in that framework document, which is the naming of what is called the third space approach. The third space is a space designed to recognize friction and tension. But nowhere else in the framework document is there much of a recognition that there be any pain involved in indigenizing the curriculum. No pain in the past, no pain in the future, no pain. <laughs> okay, basically it doesn't, it says there's gonna be no pain, it's gonna be pain free. But I'm going to talk more about that in part four, when I suggest some reasons why psychology appears to downplay the friction, the conflict and the pain that will lay ahead and tell you what this teaches us about what's wrong with psychology's approach to indigenizing the curriculum. So till then, ta-da. <laughs>